Welcome to Pineland Underground, the official podcast of the U.S. Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School. Here we explore critical themes across the realm of Army Special Operations. This is Pineland Underground. All right, welcome back to the Pineland Underground podcast. Once again, we are recording from the Falcon Snail Pub. Falcon Snail Pub. And the owner, once again, has allowed us to use this space. Um, seems like a pretty cool dude again. Anyway, Very kind of him to let us use this space to record. Sweet, it's really man. amazing. Um, but today we have a guest brought on by Bobby Tuttle, who's been just talking about you for a while now. So that's kind of weird. But uh, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Bobby so he can, he can give the introduction. Yeah, so uh, Bobby Tuttle here. Absolute pleasure to be hosting Rob McQueen, a good friend, a mentor, and a co-worker that I've worked with for years. Uh, we, go, we go back since our time working at the Special Operations Training Detachment down at Fort Polk, Louisiana at JRTC, the Joint Readiness Training Center. I instantly uh, gravitated towards Rob. Uh, for his ability uh, to really integrate civil affairs into what we were doing and the unconventional warfare scenario we had at the time around 2015, 2016, and we've remained close friends since. So uh, Rob himself, a civil affairs officer by trade, an entrepreneur, and humanitarian by passion and by nature. Uh, Rob graduated from the University of Idaho. What, what year was that, Rob? Oh, man, 06. Okay, 2006. And really his military career began as a light infantry reconnaissance platoon leader, and then he moved on to a company executive officer all within the 101st Airborne Division. So an infantry, uh, infantry officer by nature when he first started out his time in the Army. And then following his time, Rob volunteered for special operations and graduated the Civil Affairs Qualification Course and joined the Civil Affairs Regiment from then on. And Rob served as two special operations uh, team leaders focused on counterterrorism and countering violent extremism operations in Afghanistan and also the Balkans. So pretty robust experience. Uh, he's served worldwide in both named and contingency operations. And then he's worked with entities such as the United Nations, European Union, <laughs> NATO, and USAID, and then multiple non-governmental organizations focused on disaster response and really stability operations. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been published on the importance of disaster response in international diplomacy. He has also served as a subject matter expert and panelist on countering violent extremism and then combating the growing foreign fighter phenomenon for the National Counterterrorism Center. So pretty robust experience. Rob, again, good friend. What I'd like to kind of add here too is a little bit after his pathway uh, on active duty in the Army, Rob left active duty to join Waves for Water. And now Waves for Water is a guerrilla humanitarian organization focused on providing access to clean water to remote and austere communities. Uh, while at Waves for Water, Rob led disaster relief operations in over 30 countries across the globe. And he also helped found the Veterans Division called the Clean Water Corps and deployed veterans on more than 40 missions to over 20 countries across, across the globe. He also works following the uh, drastic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Rob left as a full-time humanitarian and founded a leadership development company, Sine Pare, which translates to without equal. Also our USASOC motto. Oh, we completely stole the name. That's okay. Yeah, we, we stole it 100%. <laughs> and then their campus is in Texas. Uh, Sine Pare uses an experiential learning model to build leadership attributes and capabilities in junior and senior level executives from business to nonprofit sectors. So Rob, once again, just kind of a wave tops for your introduction, but hey, welcome to the show, man. Yeah, thanks brother. Thanks for having me on. I think I'm gonna have to go back in and remove a lot of the $5 words uh, out of the bio there. That's uh, it. All but <laughs> that, that gets Bobby here. He gets allocated one officer point for that introduction. <laughs> I know. That was, that was solid. Like, he went all the way through it. I was impressed. What, what I think is really impressive, though, and again, we're going to dive into some of these great topics here. You know, Rob served active duty, focused yep. on civil affairs operations within special operations, but also the conventional force. He's dabbled in both. Yep. Then Rob also went out on the nonprofit side. And as a civil affairs reservist, use his expertise and experiences to go out and be a humanitarian. And he served as an entrepreneur, starting some businesses, bringing in like-minded individuals and rock star soft people that he's worked with and taking those skills to provide disaster relief and response across the globe. 
So incredibly experienced. And actually, he's right now here at Fort Bragg with us uh, here in North Carolina, uh, instructing at the Civil Affairs Captain Career Course as a guest instructor because he has such a rock star background experience. So yeah, I, you know, you got to pay the piper. I do that IMA gig. So, you know, every, every month, one month a year, Uncle Sam gets his due. <laughs> you also get one more officer point. He said entrepreneur who has started businesses. The definition of an entrepreneur is <laughs> just what it is. <laughs> redundancy. That's not like the officer points. I'll go for the redundancy piece. Yeah. If you make sense, you get NCO points. Um, <laughs> if you make up words, you get officer points. More acronyms, officer points. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Rob. So let's talk about civil affairs within okay. Army Special Operations, mm-hmm. which there are. We got Ranger Regiment. We've got SMUs. But for our definition right now, we'll clarify that. Army Special Operations for this discussion is Civil Affairs, PSYOP, and Special Forces. And within that, we all have our different roles, but we function as teams we deploy. But let's define Civil Affairs. Oh, man. All right, defining Civil Affairs. So when I talk to, especially, so I'm kind of going back to my time as a team leader, like how did I describe what we do to either the task force commander to, I mean, even down to just my partner, you know, when I was with the SEALs, SEAL Team 2, just like, hey, that sister platoon commander, hey, here's who I'm attached to, how do I tell them what I did? And so the way I've always described it is that we identify and assess civil vulnerabilities in order to mitigate or exploit those vulnerabilities in support of the commander's intent, right? So what does that mean? So that what means, does that mean, Rob? Right, what does that mean? So I get to know and understand what makes a society tick from all the way down at a local village level to at a larger economic infrastructure, you know, political level. And if I understand what makes that tick, I can break it down and find out where there are gaps in that society. And when I mean gap, I mean, where is the population not having its needs met by the government or not having its needs met by the local structure or not having its needs met by its local community and kind of those social structures. Because when I find out where that is, I can one, identify who is leveraging that. Like when I say who, I kind of think like non-state actors, um, you know, negative state actors, any of those, any of that negative piece that are trying to affect the environment in competition with us. Okay. Or I can understand and I can identify them and then try to kind of remove some of those gaps that they operate in. Or I can see how I personally can leverage those gaps by either closing it up and, and bringing the, finding what the gap is, closing it, bring it together. Let's say, you know, Maslow hierarchy of needs and like the current day, number one is Wi-Fi. So let's find a way to put some Wi-Fi into a system for lack of a simpler term. Okay. And I'll get into that piece because it's an interesting communications yeah. and interesting piece in the modern environment. Uh, or I can figure out how to kind of exploit that, right? So if we need to get our way into that gap, if we need to shape the society, then we can figure out how we can leverage that gap in society through either us providing influence, uh, an NGO, or someone else providing that need that could then, you know, delegitimize or work against that host nation. Help me understand what you mean by mapping. Yeah. So for some of our listeners who may not be totally familiar with like, you know, what mapping a network looks like. Yeah. Um, What what does that look like in the construct of mapping the civil infrastructure or the players and who's involved and then the things that make that populace or that community tick. Right. So let, let's look at it from say, uh, and I had this conversation today with a good friend of mine. Uh, so let's take a look at say every small town has like a chamber of commerce, right? Or a city council. And on that city council, you're going to have your political leaders. You're going to have your business leaders. You're going to have that interaction between the two. So we would take the city council, the mayor, and and we would draw a little circle around and be like, hey, this is the political side. And then we'd look at, say, okay, who do they know uh, on the econ- economic side? So let's find the business leaders and let's put them on a piece of paper and draw a circle around them. And then let's look at hey, who are the social leaders, like who are the religious leaders, who are the youth group leaders, who are who are the sports coaches, like right, who are the teachers and who ma- and who that's your social piece. And then we would find out where they all connect, right? And then we would kind of do that to understand and, and really draw a picture like map, so to speak, but draw a picture uh, that will represent the connections between people, uh, buildings, you know, infrastructure, systems, whatever it is that makes this small town tick. And then you can really take a look at it and understand really kind of how that community and how that population works. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if we're going to break this down for like, say, a junior 18 Bravo weapon starting on an SFODA. Right. The civil affairs guy, he's your he's your SME or your expert on all the stuff that you don't know because you, you're always worried about knowing guns and this stuff. But when you go into any country, there's going to be a village exactly. or something that you're working with people. And this guy is the one that can map all that out because that's what he dedicates his job to. Exactly. He's knowing everything that you don't want to because you're worried about 
your job. Exactly. And, and so he can, he can take all that off your plate. He can tell you what to look for. So when you're out training your partner force or you're doing any of your engagements, you can understand what he's looking for. And then you can start to take some weight off the team leader, the warrant, maybe the fox, and start to be able to do and facilitate that targeting process from the civilian side, right? Like, how do we look at what exists in this area? Like, if we want to degrade a violent extremist organization and they use this logistics pathway to you know support some of their fighters well hey how can we degrade that logistics pathway through maybe a non-kinetic means so that integration and targeting could kind of remove some of that extra lift and, and integrate into i think that fusion cell concept i think is is where it sits and then that the entity that you have there that civil affairs entity mm -hmm. it's it's almost the the ability to have the ultimate forced access and placement into almost any area that you want exactly. in the world right that's exactly it that's a hundred percent it all right you have a you have a reason for being there like yes yes we know this guy who's a, who's a negative actor is mm -hmm. here, but how do we get access to this place? Exactly. Yeah. Right. And, that, and that's, I mean, that's the benefit of it, especially when you look at kind of a, a compete environment, right? When you're looking at not a highly kinetic or a, you know, that quote unquote peacetime environment, right? Because I'm not coming in. I am not a threatening team. I'm not bringing in 12 dudes that are here to teach other people to shoot, move, communicate, medicate, right? Um, what I'm there to do is understand the issues that are happening. Mm -hmm. And then I can provide that feedback to both the TSOC that I'm working for and, and directly to the chief of mission uh, and integrate with that interagency and work through all those different departments. Be like, hey, did you know this was happening in this area? What are you curious about? And I had a lot of experience doing that at the U.S. Embassy in Sarajevo that really painted a picture for me of where, uh, where we fit uh, in kind of that that mesh uh, of, of, you know, the pr projection of, of U.S. power, right? right. And that diplomatic information, military, economic. Dime. Dime, right? The dime. And that's real, power. right? It I is. mean, that's, if you look at the history of just everything that we've ever done, right? Like, even in Vietnam, it's like, oh, you know what? We've overplayed our hands, or we've overplayed our hand using the military yep. as a means to influence the world. And everybody sees that. So now how do we go back and, and play the, the diplomatic game to, yep. to restore balance? But it's the same tactically that's same thing that's what we do right and then i would say that uh, the civil affairs person's your ultimate lno for usaid yep. state department all these other entities which are very powerful and bring a lot to the table for you absolutely if you check your ego and allow yourself to utilize well, and a lot use of or utilize them right we had, a, we had an argument <laughs> we had a discussion in a previous podcast about the difference between use and utilize, but yeah, for the intended purpose it's <laughs> use yeah. for something that's not the intended purpose it's utilize. which you could do both right Oh, well, utilize seems like a more technical term because it's like oh, I'm mean, going to utilize cool, right? this weapon, this you know, this M4 to, uh, to, you know, to destroy an enemy threat. Yeah, but that's no, it's so it's used for. That's yeah. the same hey, I'm going to use this EOD guy to clear this, <laughs> this ID, or I'm going to utilize my CA team to clear this ID. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what that looks like. Just a bunch, just throwing cert money out and see if it lands on an IED as we walk forward. Like throw the twenty, see if it blows it up. So, so Chuck, Chuck and I, uh, you, know, you just talked about shoot, move, communicate, mm -hmm. medicate, sustain, which I, I would kind of go through, and those are the, the specialty skills of a special forces team, mm -hmm. uh, which Chuck and I are, are, are uh, you know, we've kind of hit on that for previous episodes. Talk us through what a civil affairs team looks like, okay, and the kind of specific roles or functions of everybody on that team. Yeah. As they come into a country and they're there not to shoot, move, communicate, medicate, right. sustain, but focus on the government's portion and focus on the civil aspect. Yeah. So when you look at a four-man CA team and, and they're different between special operations and conventional. And so I'll kind of focus on the special operations piece right now. Sure. Uh, and so you have a team leader that's a captain. You're going to have your team sergeant uh, who is your E7. And that team sergeant, again, this is that relationship team leader, team sergeant. They're responsible for everything the team does and fails to do. That team sergeant is the backbone and really looks at that team leader and be like, you are off the rails, brother. We need to dial this back. Uh, but he brings that experience uh, really into that team. Uh, and then you're going to have on the soft side, you have your 38 Bravo, uh, which I don't know if they've changed it now for the soft. That's a whole and now 38 is the, uh, the, so the military 30, occupational yeah. specialty or MOS. Right. So okay. you have 18 for SF, 37 for PSYOP, and then 38 for CA. Okay. And so the 38 Bravo is what your, your CA NCO or what you're calling now the civil reconnaissance specialist. So he is your brass tacks, young NCO that is just getting after it. And his expertise is trying to get out, 
really look at what the civilian populace is doing and drive that kind of uh, reconnaissance mindset, right? So he's he is your he's he's the on the ground sensor that you're really focusing on using. So, okay. and then on the other side of that, we have our 38 uh, Delta or Whiskey, whatever it's called now, and that's our special operations combat medic. So we have a SOCA medic on each CA team on the soft side, which is just a huge force multiplier. You guys know with 18 Deltas, the SF medics. Just the capability and the survival, like what they bring to the table is amazing. And so we used ours very heavily in Bosnia uh, to build an entire training program for the, the counterterrorism forces and special police units in Bosnia that led to a, a lot of great things. But so that's the breakdown uh, of that CA team. Love it. Okay. I do want to take that and go into the discussion about what we were talking about earlier before we even started recording was main effort versus supporting effort mm-hmm. versus checking your ego and using that fulcrum approach. And we were talking about a special program that we stood up in, in 2010, right? And we actually called it the program the Population Studies Group. Sounds very CA heavy, right? Mm-hmm. Population Studies, Studies Group. Group. I um, like that. And it was when we stood up the Afghan National Army Special Forces Program, and we just made their special forces teams with civil affairs and science. Guys, I just, they're just part of the team. Um, but understanding that what we really had to do was understand first the terrain that we were going into, yep. right? Um, so... If we can all check our egos, though, and we're, and we're going into these these teams, right? We were talking about, you know, with cross-functional teams, unified action partners. Like, everybody thinks that these words are new and that these concepts are new. Like, no, it's we've always just functioned as teams in the military. Um, but if you can check your ego, you can figure out what's most applicable right now that is going to get the most bang for the buck, right? Absolutely. Let's, yeah, let's talk about that and get your opinions on that. Yeah, I, I mean, you couldn't. I don't think I could have said it any better. I mean, that's exactly You it. probably could have. It's just a <laughs> <laughs> it's i mean it's exactly that and so i looked out and, and the best there's my career uh on the soft side was kind of unique in my deployment to afghanistan was with seal team two uh and the seals had a bit of a kerfuffle that turned everything up a, a few people left right when i got to the site uh and they ended up bringing in uh another officer to come in and kind of fill the roles the seal the platoon commander and he and i hit it off really well uh, interesting, amazing, really one of the most amazing dudes I've ever met in my life. But uh, we were able to sit down and be like, hey, if you want to, and you know, with SEALs, like if you want to go out and shoot somebody, this is how we're going to have to engage with the population. We need to go out every day. Here's the targeting and here's the assessments we need to understand. We need to understand the population around us because that is our center of gravity at this point. So what we did and kind of the way we looked at it is we just assigned those roles. Like, hey, in the beginning, like when we go out and start meeting with all these villages, hey, Rob, you and your team, main effort, right? Like we will support getting you in. We'll do the we'll primary, like we'll set security. We'll move in. You guys do the engagements, build that build that understanding, build the map of the society and, and what's going on. And then we'll go back and start kind of targeting through it. And when you say engagements, you mean like meeting? With Meetings, the, yeah. The, the, the players. Exactly. The yeah. The so to clear that up, like yeah. a civil engagement to go sit down with like the local leaders, you know, the guy that drives the water truck in and out, the, you know, the guy that... You know, loads the trailer up with Poppy and drives it down to the next village, right? So going through that process, right? And just getting to know everything that's happening because and VSO or village stability operations, like it was the idea of go village to village in the mountains of Afghanistan, get each of them to build up their own security force, manage their own population, and then move to the next village and go and from that, there. That was kind of similar to like an all glorified neighborhood watch program. Yep. Okay. Well armed. Well armed well, neighborhood. Well armed, but also able to protect themselves yes. and then report on nefarious behavior to exactly. good guy forces so that yep. they could you know prevent you know prevent further trafficking of drugs weapons bad yep. things yeah create those systems that allowed that society kind of function on its own and okay. more or less build a bridge to initially us and then eventually to the Afghan government that would allow them to kind of support each other yeah. that was the goal at least and i think we there were positives and negatives to that program uh, some wins and losses but that was where we kind of aligned. And as we started to make a lot of headway and we went from about 500 meters of white space. And when I say white space, we could go about 500 meters outside of our little VSO site before we got shot up. Right. Okay. And so we went from 500 meters to 10 kilometers to 20. And then we established a little three man outpost because we just had to own a piece of terrain. And then that would get hit all the time. But at that point it was like, all right, so we've built a little white space. We're going to shift. Hey, we're going to go kinetic heavy for the next few days to kind of push, push the Taliban out. And then you were going to switch again. And so we would go into a kinetic heavy piece and we would support the kinetic flight. And that would just shift. You would just shift who the main effort was. And you would just, for a small team, I think we had, for part of that, we had like six SEALs, my four-man team, two Saya Bubba's, and 11 uplift infantry. And that's all we had. 
And so we just would rotate on who was really kind of running the ground force command piece, who was diving into it based on what we needed to do. Uh, and it just worked phenomenally well because there were no egos. Everyone was in the fight together. Uh, and we made a lot of headway until, you know, and eventually you, you outpace your logistics and support and, you know, things go down from there. But I, I think that's the best way. And I don't know, Chuck, if that answered your question. Of no, really I think like, that's, that's important, right? Cause let's just throw out the definition of war, right? Socially sanctioned violence yep. in order to meet a political in-state, right? So although there's violence involved, it's always a political in-state. So when people say, oh, you know, this is getting too political or this, at the end of the day, Warfare, the army, is a means to achieve. It's, we're, po- we're, po- we're the tools of a politician at the end of the day, right? You don't just go fight a war to fight a war. You fight a war to influence something somewhere in order to achieve some kind of goal for Absolutely. the nation, right? But when we're deployed a lot of times, you got to figure, okay, what's the best way to influence this environment around me to achieve that? And, right, we have dime. Um, people can argue whether it's we need more or less, but th- the reality is to figure out where – you need to apply that and on the battlefield, which element right now within my whole inventory of this team is, is the best to use in order to, to, to affect what I'm doing here within my mission to achieve whatever your strategic goal is to achieve right. that political end state. Sometimes we don't know what the political end state is. Like I can say in Afghanistan, I was fighting there for 20 years. I didn't really understand what it was. Maybe I just missed the briefing. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't get the memo. <laughs> there were a few memos sent out. I don't know which one you want to look at. <laughs> I didn't get the memo, but at the end of the day, that's that's what we're geared for. What, what do we, you know, and it's not always kinetic. No. Right. Well, well it, sorry. Well, I was going to chime in with, with kind of Chuck's comments is like, you look at the dime construct, you know, so the military or, or war, mm-hmm. you, using the military for war is kind of a last resort. Right. Mm-hmm. However, the military functions that we have especially within special operations are left of bang oh, yeah. left of, you know phase zero if you look at phases of mm-hmm. operation phases of conflict you know left of before bad things happen and they are intended to be preventative intended to be a deterrent yep. but also it is understanding what's happening on the ground so if if bad thing happens crisis overthrow coup you name it you know, war turns into the option, then we, the U.S. military, is prepared because they have mapped that civil environment. Mm -hmm. They know what the infrastructure looks like, the needs of the people, the will of the people, the political infrastructure and decision makers on the ground so that we can try to influence and then, as a last resort, destroy... um, yeah. Go to war. It, it's interesting too because I think when you look at it, there's there's two aspects to a functioning successful society, and they're kind of a weird piece too. I mean, one's not one's legitimacy, right? Like if the people don't believe in that government, if they don't actually support it and submit to the socially agreed rules, like the the political systems, then it's not going to work. The other side of it is a monopoly on violence, and I think this is what people don't understand: is a functioning society doesn't mean there's no violence. It just means that the government owns the monopoly on violence, right? And so when you're looking at Afghanistan, when you're looking at any, you know, actual kinetic environment, you know, Iraq post, you know, post 2003, especially in 2007, 2008, when I was there, like it is, we are competing with another organization that is trying to take that monopoly on violence and the legitimacy from that government. So there is no peaceful society. There is always somebody with a gun and you just want that gun to generally belong to the system that belongs to the people. And it doesn't always work that way. Really well put. Rob, does anybody within the Department of Defense do what civil affairs does? No, I think not to an extent. So, and when you look at it, it's kind of interesting, right? So you have civil affairs operations and then you have civil military operations, right? So, when I was an infantry officer or an infantry platoon leader, we did civil military operations. I remember negotiating contracts between shakes for the Sons of Iraq program. Like, all right, I need 200 fighters from you. I need 200 fighters from you. All right, what do you want? All right, you want, you need this chicken coop up? All right, I'll go find somebody that can open the chicken coop so I can get the 200 fighters from your from your tribe. Like, this is going to happen. Like, I never thought in a million years I would be doing that, right? It's a raid and then I'm negotiating chicken coops. Uh, so that's civil military operations, right? And those are generally planned by civil affairs officers at a, at a higher headquarters. 
uh, and then the, executed by and then executed the by regular affairs. military, right? Okay. That is non-civil affairs. So it is CMO, right? Civil military operations. Everybody does it because we've realized, especially at this point, and you know, CA really started uh, back in World War II in the occupation of Germany. But we really look at this, and it's like, hey, there is no warfare without the civil populace, especially in today's environment, and when today is kind of asymmetric or you know irregular threats, if you want to call it that way. And so you have to pay attention to it. So everyone has to be involved in civil military operations. Then you have civil affairs operations, which are a little more targeted, a little more specific and geared towards really painting and targeting and understanding that civilian environment, that, that you know, that civil common operating picture. And that is executed and planned by civil affairs uh, soldiers. So you're telling me as I was a special forces attachment commander for mm -hmm. ODA 1125 combat divers, uh, from Okinawa, deployed to Afghanistan. Always, always got to put on. I was a, I was a combat, combat diver. diver. Combat yeah. dive guys. <laughs> One officer <Dive> point. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know I had my beard in Afghanistan mm -hmm. with my team, and I was meeting with our provincial <laughs> leaders yep. and having chai over a KLE, a key leader engagement. Yep. With my fighters, with my Afghan local police, mm -hmm. and my Afghan special forces commandos. Yep. I was doing civil military operations. That's correct that were planned out primarily through a civil affairs team at a higher headquarters should be passed down. Should have been a, in that theory. And, and again, we go back to the, the strategy above and, mm -hmm. and SF's a unique piece because the entire role of SF is to work inside that local population. Right. And so, but yes, uh, in theory, that engagement, that thought process should have been at least heavily influenced by the, uh, the S9. I, I, talk about this. I, I wrote this out while you were talking here on this piece of paper. Cause I was just like, okay, this is pretty interesting. So civil affairs, PSYOP, SF, right? So mm -hmm. the primary mission of civil affairs is to legitimize or, or work on legitimacy with another aspect to also work on delegitimizing sometimes, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Power. But PSYOP, the primary is delegitimizing with, you know, another mission to legitimize right. when needed. And you got special forces, which foreign internal defense and unconventional warfare goes either way, right? But then when you combine all three, pretty pop. Exactly. Mind blown. <laughs> I read a little diagram here. <laughs> We're going to publish it's that. got the arrows the, and everything. I yeah, love it. Yeah, go on the Pineland Underground yeah. uh, website. That's yeah, but it's not a new concept. Like, we've been doing that forever, right? No, like, and it's it's really interesting because what you went on and from what I've seen on the contract side working with, you know, the cross-functional teams is what I really see is <laughs> I see CA really heavily integrating into that targeting cycle. And so almost in like kind of the find fix realm, right? Uh, and then you end up with PSYOP being able to hit that influence environment, right? And hit the, the information world uh, and try to influence things through that network. And then you run into SF that can do the finish work on other, on other avenues, more kinetic avenues. And that's where I've really seen it work well together. Uh, and it just depends on that integration between the CA team that's, with, that's attached to the ODA, that team leader, and then the ODA commander and that relationship and how well that CA team can integrate into how that ODA runs. So let's go down that hole real quick. So you're telling me, Rob, who, and again, we've worked together previously mm -hmm. and, and down at the Joint Readiness Training Center where we uh, we, we kind of started our friendship yep. having worked together and yeah. complementing roles and just, just having fun down there. So you're telling me that Civil Affairs, PSYOP, and Special Forces have their own kind of swim lanes mm -hmm. of missions or, or purposes that they do. Right. But it can all come together Absolutely. and they all complement one another. So you just hit on the term cross-functional team. And they all overlap a little bit, right? They, yeah, 100%. 100% overlap a little bit. And they, I would say they are heavily More than weighted. More they all overlap. Them. Everybody's got their primary function. Yep. But used together. Boom. 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 <laughs> and That's exactly it. So, you know, we we're we throwing around the term cross-functional team. It's a non-doctrinal term from my understanding. I hate it. <laughs> we but, just go with team. I think from here on out, yeah, we like, just go with like team. Yeah, like we said like earlier, entrepreneur starts businesses. <laughs> cross-functional <laughs> team. Like a team is – it's already that. It's like a task organized for purpose. It's ridiculous. Yep. Uh, <laughs> we should we should really go to every NFL team. Be like, how is your cross functional yeah, team? You, guys, you, you guys have, have a kicker, lineman. You have your offense, kicker. Team, you've got a defensive team. line. Yeah, yeah right? the NFL doesn't use cross functional. It's, it's exactly team. it. Just sports a team. team. It's not a sports cross functional team. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone has their role on a team, right? <laughs> you don't have to tell them it's yeah, different. Yeah, <laughs> so, so uh, I had a great call with the uh, the guys down at Sati uh, Special Operations Training Attachment today, focused on another officer point. <laughs> how <laughs> how RSOF Army Special Operations is training in a large scale combat operations environment. So you got the premier 
uh, uh, combined training centers, the CTCs, JRTC at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and NTC at Fort Irwin, California. Desert in the swamp. The desert desert, desert swamp. swamp, and you've got you've got a team of about thirty soft people, mm-hmm. uh, commanded by a uh, post battalion commander o- o 05, about to be O six, that kind of covers down on the individuals that serve as observers, coaches, and trainers, and plan the exercises for those special operations teams to go train. And it's phenomenal training. Uh, couldn't speak more highly of, of the turnkey type training that happens down there. But what I want to get into is our soft task force. So we're training in a large, large scale combat operations, the future fight, right? Against near peer adversaries, Russia, China, uh, similar to what's going on right now in, in, in Russia and Ukraine, right? Occupation of forces, uh, multi-domain operations, things are, hap- things are happening in space, cyber, on the ground. Uh, there's no battle front lines mm-hmm. per se. And so down there, the RSOFT task force. So you have a special forces company commanded by an O4 with his elements, support elements. You have a FIRES individual, or FIRES entity, SEMA, electronic warfare. You have civil affairs, PSYOPs, uh, special operations teams, Alpha, SOT As. You got all these things that come together. And I think what we're talking about is that's an RSOFT task force or a cross-functional team, but you can task Sorry. organize. Just said it through it all this me. sounds like, oh, let's go back to 1991 Gulf War and air land battle, which we proved works, right? It's just take everything and use it together. That's it. <laughs> That's all it is. But, but it's the synchronization of its use. Ooh, does that get an officer point for synchronization? Mm, I, I yeah. think so. Because if you look at an orchestra, you're not going to use every single instrument at once. No. They're going to play. They're going to build up. Some sort of note's going to happen in the orchestra that you can't use another note for. And so at phases of the operation and phases of conflict, the civil affairs team probably doesn't need to be on the front lines. Probably. In the, probably. It does not need to be in the front lines of the close fight of conflict where I would say bullets are flying immediately overhead and you're being targeted. You want your entities to be geographically located so that they can best complement the mission at hand. Right. I, I think that's exactly it, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to be in that front spot. I think you just have to look at where do we need them to be? Uh, do we need them on the ground with that ODA based on what that mission set is? And LISCO is an interesting one. I think we could go down a, a thousand different lanes sure. about how an ODA is utilized in LISCO. But I, or I think, used. One of, either yeah, way. Yeah. Mostly utilized. Is it, you, <laughs> are we utilized or used? Uh, we just had a whole argument with uh, the creditors that came from TradeOc about our, you know, utilization or use in LISCO operations. <laughs> it was like, no, you guys, primary purpose is direct action. Like, no, that's a very small part of what we do. Very small. Um, so for us to do a whole planning scenario in every PME based on direct action is ridiculous. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Uh, but it really comes down to you, uh, when you build a team, you have to understand, you know, what do I need this team to accomplish? Yes. And what what skill sets do I need in that team, right? So it, it's that simple. I don't know why it becomes more complicated than that. Probably egos and, you know, arguments over OERs. OERs. Uh, I, I think a big one I've seen is, is money, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I remember the, the, the back and forth uh, around UW and it was like, hey, conventional army wants to own an AOB. They want it pieced off to that brigade. And they want it pieced off because, hey, guess what? The conventional mission's going away. We want to own a piece of this because with the mission comes money. Sure. And so, and, and everyone is going to fight. I, it was put to me very well by a 06 uh, in Germany from from Sokir. And he goes, and I was fighting for, I was kind of trying to negotiate some of that security cooperation money for Bosnia and, and, and have that discussion. I was very animated, you know, very enthusiastic captain sitting at a table with 05s and 06s. And he goes, hey, come over here. I was like, all right, listen. It's like, I get it. I understand what you want to accomplish. But what you have to understand is you're not the only person at the table. And you may or may not be the main effort. But the other thing you have to understand is you're not always the hero in the fight, bro. Yes. Like, you've got to take a step back and realize, like, oh, I'm fighting for my peace. And everyone should fight for their peace. Like, nobody should lay down and be like, you know what? You don't need me. But you should be willing to like, hey, I presented my case. This is why I think I'm the best one to execute this target or to fin- to, to generate this effect. And, you know, if, if everyone goes, hey, that's not you, cool. How can I support you? Right? Take a step back and be like, hey, you got it. Where do you need me so you can achieve the objective? Right. But that's a tough thing to do. I'm, I'm going to go to kind of a football reference here. And 
again, everybody has their job to do a specific yeah. role on whatever play it is, right? Mm-hmm. So you got you got a, you got a run play, right? You need your blockers to go actually block, and that is a main effort because the the, the running back, you know, the, the the fullback can't get into the open space right. without that block that you made first. You know, pass play, the play action, uh, you know, wide receiver can't get open unless he has a screen or or you know the play action doesn't occur so that it draws the linebackers in from the quarterback to make that nice open pass. And so everybody has to do their job at whatever specific point. But the whole intent is to win the game. Completely. And so I think it's a great, great analogy right there. And I think you hit it on the head, uh, head Rob. I actually want to steal it a little bit because I sure. think it talks to, and you know, we can talk about what CA does and, and go down the route, but I think the relationship between CA, SIAB, and SF is a really interesting one. And so when you look at, uh, for lack of a better word, the, the, uh, the personal relationship inside of that football analogy, right? Because you have Tom Brady as his favorite receiver, right? They, they have that faith in that running back. Like the coach is deciding, hey, at this point, who's going to be able to get it across the goal line? Who's going to be able to get it in? And I think that's where when you really look at the relationships and you look at the teams is do we have that relationship where SF goes that the ODA commander or the task force commander goes, OK, CA, you're the best one to execute this. Do I have faith in you to do it? And that's going to be based on their previous experience. You know, if it's a task force commander, it's going to be their previous experience working with CA on an ODA. And it's the same thing, vice versa. So if we're working in a you know more non-kinetic environment, CA has the lead, and I need a JSET to come in. Do I trust that that JSET's going to come in and not burn any of the relationships that I've built? And it's an interesting dynamic that I think is very unique to special operations because the formations are so small and the missions are run so far away from the flagpole that those interpersonal relationships, I think, are one what makes soft so successful but also is what makes it difficult for us to really quantify what that team looks like and how these task force are supposed to operate and execute. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll say when I was, I'm just thinking back when I was a younger special forces guy, I used to hate the term kinetic versus kinetic. I'm like, no, so I signed up for it's all direct action and I didn't understand it. But then, you know, looking back, I just didn't realize I didn't have the picture of the game. And that's yeah. why I didn't look at it mm-hmm. like you, you get new, the like play, not the game. Yeah, yeah. It's all a game, yeah. right? It's, it's a geopolitical game. Mm-hmm. It's when you're there in country, that's the game for achieving a win. What does it look like? What is the end state? But the reality is kinetic means aren't always necessary. Non-kinetic means aren't always the right answer. Yep. But how do you balance those out to where and use the right tools for the job? And just thinking back, I probably didn't. I probably didn't understand why it was important until way too late, right? But as a younger, you're like, oh, it's stupid. I signed up to do this, and this isn't what I signed up for. Like, you signed up to play the game. There's yep. no draft, right? And the game is the game does not give a shit about your opinion. The game is what it is. So if you don't adapt to it to win it, you're not going to win. You don't show up to a game Monopoly and not understand the rules or think the rules are stupid and dominate the game. You, you got to take a step like, okay, let me understand the rules, and then I'll play and win. Yep. Right? It's Absolutely. never cool to be ignorant. Never cool no. To be ignorant. We've all been there. We've all been yeah. creating, oh, yeah. thinking that we know everything. Oh, yeah. So, yep. you know, all right. So, real quick, I'm looking at my point ledger here, and I actually gave you one point for use of the word kerfuffle earlier. <laughs> kerfuffle. <laughs> kerfuffle, yeah. Um, so, you guys are almost evenly tied right now. Could have used the word mutiny, but I thought kerfuffle <laughs> was a little nicer. <laughs> I want to talk now about – we use the word unified action partners, but let's talk about – Unified action partner versus interagency stuff. And then on the ground talking about, hey, we want to win. So how do we play the game appropriately, which is not always just whack-a-mole or what everybody wants to do is go shoot and get in a gunfight, which is fun. But if you're actually going to dominate that battlefield, how do you get there and, and assess and utilize everything that's available to you? Like if you go to Firebase, there's probably a CMOC. Mm-hmm. There's probably USCID reps. And, you know, there's probably somebody there, if they're not attached to you, with some kind of CERT funds, if it's, if it's with the the army unit there or with you, what are those things for one? And then how do you use them? Yeah. So it's, I think unified action partners is a really interesting piece because it's organizations and individuals outside of your organization, right? That all have a shared piece in that, in the end state. Like everyone wants to achieve the same thing for a variety of different reasons, but it's kind of a shared end state. And so using them or utilizing them, how you bring that together For a commander is really hard because they don't belong to the task force. Mm -hmm. They don't belong to you. In fact, in a lot of instances, they might actually be completely opposed to working with you, even though they want to achieve the same thing. And you might be opposed to working with them. And you might. Oh, (laughs) absolutely. At times. Um, So when you look at that, 
really what you have to talk about is so you have non-governmental organizations, you have other nonprofits, you have local agencies, local government organizations, you have local uh, power brokers, you have USAID, uh, the United States Agency for International Development, you have the Department of State and all the wealth of, of offices and, and departments underneath the Department of State. And you have all of these things, uh, and then foreign governments as well, <laughs> that have all of these other entities, the United Nations. Did our forefathers have to like worry about these organizations on the battle space? 100%. How do you think we got all the weapons from the French? <laughs> <laughs> the French are your first unified action partner. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> <laughs> think, of like, think of the Alamo Scouts. Think of the integration with uh, the uh, Native American trackers and warriors. Like Think of that entire piece. We've been yeah. running unified action partners forever. Thanksgiving is the first celebration <laughs> towards unified action partners. Um, if you look at it that way, that's probably a reach, but I thought I'd throw that one out there. Uh, so when you look at it, the really what I always tell my students and, and I learned myself is you have to build a relationship because I think if I can have one theme to this, it's have a relationship with the people you work with. If you can't build a relationship, you're not going to work well together. Okay. Uh, and then the other side is create a shared vision and a good commander should learn how to create a shared vision. Anyway, if you can't do that internal to your team, uh, it's going to be hard to do it outside. But if you can create that shared vision, communicate it well, and then communicate how they feed into that kind of joining of efforts. I don't want to say synchronization because we're just going to go down a path. And I want to stay under two officer points on this on this trip. But uh, that's the thought process, right? Like how do I get an organization like myself as a humanitarian, right? Like working for Waves for Water. How do you get me and my goal, which is to provide access to clean water, how do you get me to – work with you or to like even synchronize kind of in time and space like, or at least you know share a, share a four by four on the on the way out to the site how do you get me to work with you so i know that our intentions are the same and that my organization is not going to suffer from working with you right from a visibility standpoint or even from an operational and security standpoint mm -hmm. so that's the that's the rub with unified action partners they're a critical piece and i think we do in general a poor job uh, as a military. And I think often we end up taking on a lot of work ourselves. I think the military soft in general tends to take on a lot of that workload. Because uh, we have to do the ego there, or do you think that's due to other? You know, I think it's one of those things when, when you get in that fist fight, right? When you are engaged at that level, and I don't always mean kinetic, but when you are, hey, this is my AO, this is what I'm trying to achieve, this is where I'm trying to go, you only have so much bandwidth. And it takes a lot of energy a lot of energy to manage different relationships, different egos, different end states, different and motivations and time, right? It takes a ton of time to do this. In my 10 months in Bosnia at the end of our 11 months in Bosnia, at the end of that trip working out of the US embassy, I was smoked. The more tired and smoked than I've ever been. I was more tired than 15 after 15 months in Iraq and I was more tired than after 10 months in Afghanistan. I was way more smoked because maintain, building those relationships, maintaining those relationships, and then because of the things that happened while I was in Bosnia, actually like monetizing those networks, for lack of a better term, like actually using those relationships to achieve an effect, that was an absolute smoker. I was crushed. And I got to do a lot of fun things. I had a great time, but I was emotionally drained. And for a huge extrovert like myself, for me to actually want to just go hide in my team house was a unique experience to me. I would get calls from the ODC being like, Rob, come out and have a beer, man. It's been a good day. I'm like, no, it's 5 p.m. I'm eating a shawarma and I'm going to bed because I was, I was just tapped. So is there any place that special operations goes to to get practice reps in? working with unified action partners. So it's interesting. Uh, yes, the CTCs do do it. So they do bring in unified action partners. Waves for Water is actually going to go out. I'm going to take five of my clean water core team at the invite uh, at NTC okay. to be a unified action next partner next year yeah. uh, for some of the soft rotations, which I think will be great. Uh, a good friend of mine is out running the engagement cell out there. And he's like, hey, can I put you? He's like, I don't know when it's going to be, but can I put you on the books and you bring a team out to be a legit unified action partner? It's like, absolutely. Sure. Shout out to the uh, CTCs, NTC, and JRTC for uh, uh, soft entities looking to go tr get good turnkey training. Again, a little shout out there, of which Rob and I have good experiences. <sighs> good uh, and almost, bad. Yeah, good and bad. Hey, I'll just reps. say real quick, everybody in soft seems to talk smack about NTC, JRTC, even the infantry, which I went to both. Yep. And I've been to, I've never been to NTC and soft, but I had a great, I've never had a bad experience at a joint training. It's what you make it. I mean, it always sucks. And the infantry, one time they're like, hey, you're going to take these tow missiles and you're going to hump them to this mountain. We're like, oh, that's going to suck. And it sucked. But looking back, it was 
It's yeah. still a great experience. It's what you put into it. And I think, I mean, it probably speaks to your personality. Like I'm getting an opportunity to train. I'm going to train as best I can. And the CTCs give you Everything. a huge opportunity to train. I if mean, if you use it, if you use it and that's it. Like I've seen ODAs go out and just absolutely crush it. And I think the last four rotations I did as a contractor with ODAs, I was incredibly impressed. Like young team sergeants, foxes filling that role, uh, young team leaders, and just aggressively going after it and just and learning. And it was such a good experience to be a part of. And then I've seen times when they go out and they're like, we're done. Yep. And they just decide I'm going to take off my shirt. I'm going to sit down, get some sun, might jump in a pond and wash off a little bit. And then eventually my time's going to run out and I'm going to go home. We, we call we have a name for those. We got, you got ODAs, right? Yeah. But you also got Brodias. <laughs> <laughs> not combat dive teams. Though. Operation attachment yeah. alphas and then your Brodiers. So when they get their More. Patagonias, do they automatically come with a pop collar? If, like, if is that how that works? <laughs> 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 last, last plug for the CTCs. We'll, then we'll kind of move on. But uh, I don't it, know if they need a plug because it's one of those like you're going to go. You're going to go. There's no <laughs> plug. There's go. no so plug. You'll have a choice. Yeah. Say, so, man, I really – do we need to buy this? I'm like, no, it's not no. tickets to the Bahamas. It's just, <laughs> no. <laughs> as, as a place though where you can take your, your, your special operations entity – Integrate with as an RSOF task force. Yep. Get all your training that you want to do. You get to partner with a, a, with a pretty pretty uh, a robust partner. Get coached from experienced individuals, of which Rob and I were both uh, observers, coach trainers. That's how we met. Uh, you got experienced special operations people and role players yep. as they're coaching you through, just like any of the colexes uh, across RSOF. And then you get to show and really not just articulate, but show the conventional force that you're working with how we fight and what we can do and that value proposition that they get to experience and be like, holy shit, this is what soft does. I get it. And I want to work with these guys in the future. So 27, the- hold on, hold on, 27. That's how many officer points you used to create for that, <laughs> <laughs> that diatribe. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, I think he's positioned himself well for one, uh, a solid AAM. Yeah, he's like, from I the boss hope selling the these. And then, listening to this. Yes. Yeah. And I can. <laughs> well, and the other one, too, is he's really positioned himself well to a post retirement contracting gig yeah. one of the CTCs That's what, as, as well. <laughs> like, as a role player, like this is, a, or as a coach mentor, like you are just absolutely dialed in there, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, we're going to shift gears here as much as I want to <laughs> preach about the CTCs because I love JRTC <laughs> as a job. That's all, awesome people down there. So, <laughs> You loved Leesville. Oh, it's horrible. Hold on. So Alex. Anyway, Davis. let's not get on this ramble. Okay. <laughs> let's go to the next topic. Come on. I mean, you've got the daiquiri shack. Drive through daiquiris Drive through and mud bugs. Mud bugs. That's one stop. That's and all you, you need. And you have the big Deritter in Walmart. The Deritter Walmart. My hometown big is Walmart an hour Deritter. from Leesville. I get it. Let's, let's move on. All right. Let's move on. Shout out to Wagon Masters. And, best steak in, steak in, that, uh, in, the, in the area. And you're a 40 <laughs> minute drive to the border of Texas. Yep. Which looks like the rest of Louisiana. Rob, talk to us about Bosnia. Oh, man. Uh, So I lucked out, right? I think uh, I got my first team, uh, went to Afghanistan, and then I got a second team, which, I mean, you talk to, I mean, as an ODA commander, you often don't get that much. So I had over four years of being a team leader, which was phenomenal. Uh, So I took the second team uh, in Bravo Company 92nd and got tapped to go to do what was called a SIMC or civil military support element in Bosnia. And so that is an element that often, in, in my case, worked directly for the chief of mission or the ambassador. Uh, worked was had an office inside the U.S. Embassy and was geared towards understanding the networks that existed in Bosnia and at the time those networks that were supporting foreign fighters from the Balkans into Syria. And so my job was to understand those networks uh, and then understand the civil situation, the civil conditions that allowed those networks to function uh, and then share that information with both Sakir uh, and the uh, the ambassador and his team, and it was it was an amazing experience. Uh, I had a rad team house, lived in Sarajevo, which I'd never been to before, which is unbelievable. Uh, and I met probably the first mentor I had in the U.S. in in, in the military or in my career, which was uh, Colonel Scott Miller, who was a defense attaché. Okay, incredible man, still a mentor to this day. He he runs a, he retired in uh, in Greece, and is just doing well at life. Uh, and then another one, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, then Colonel, now retired, uh, John. Uh, John Frick, who is, uh, he was a former 10th group guy uh, and then went FAO. And those two men like absolutely shaped uh, that. And honestly, that entire office, uh, the DAO there was just a huge influence on me and gave me the trust and faith to really 
find a way to understand what's going on. I was lucky enough to be really the first team to have a full operation cycle. The team that came in before me did the entire mission setup, right? They got our house together. They got our vehicles lined up. They didn't really have a chance to operate. And so when I came in, it was like, hey, world's your oyster. Your support structures are in place. Go to work. And so I went and I spent three months, one, building relationships in the embassy, which was more cocktail parties than I remember. Uh, it's a rough life. <laughs> it's a rough life. It, it, you know, it, it's fun for a minute. Uh, and then it, and, and honestly, work. it was it's a work. lot of fun. It's work, but it, it, it is it is fun. Uh, built a lot of relationships and I started to build relationships with the Bosnian military, uh, a pro rad program and amazing people uh, called ISATAP. Uh, and I'm probably going to screw this up, but the International Criminal Investigation and Training Program uh, run by the Department of Justice. And so they work with foreign police forces and judiciary systems to bring in that kind of uh, investigative and uh, improve the law enforcement of the country, right? And so was able to get in with them and identify a major gap in their counterterrorism units. And so their counterterrorism units in Bosnia are super interesting because they were all the former Yugoslav SF prior to the war. And so uh, their commander from the uh, Federation, uh, Mirsad Vilic, who I became good friends with, was a commander was the commander of like the Yugoslav SF at the beginning of the war. Okay, and so he's like, yeah, we came together. We're like, hey, sorry, this is going to be really tough. Uh, they literally split up the ammo, split up the radios, like in the team room. I was like, good luck, brother. I'll see you on the other side. Holy smokes! And so they would have a conversation. I would sit down and have have beers with them and chat with them about it, and go through this thought process. And they would be like, yeah, I would call my friend and be like, I'm sorry, I shot your buddy today, but it was you or it was you or him, and I saw you in the scope, and it wasn't going to be you. And it was incredible to learn from these guys. And they were a, a near peer uh, on the uh, the CT side as, as a special police unit. Okay. And so, and then also going up and working with the um, Republic of Srpska. So Bosnia is split into kind of two states. The Federation, which is the Croats and the Bosniaks, the Muslims, and then the Republic of Srpska, which are basically the Bosnian Serbs. And so they had two separate governmental structures, two separate special police units. We worked and trained with both and we built uh, basically our version of TCCC. Uh, and trained all of them and also brought the Bosnian military into it. And so I spent probably four months building all of this. And then that kind of takes me up to, I built those relationships. We're running the program. I'm building relationships. I brought the Brits in. I brought ambassadors. We did a few dog and pony shows to really get international support for it. Uh, and then uh, Russia decides that Crimea is a critical entity and they take it. And so I was sitting in Bosnia when that happened and I watched Sakir go through its immediate rapid Was that a process. surprise to anybody though? Yes. Really? I, it looking was, back, I was like, man, Georgia should never been a surprise. Like, they, I, I believe if we look back, like, Putin's been pretty open oh, about yeah, his completely. goals, right? Tell I think that we just, them. we were surprised because we chose to be surprised. Yep, I think so. Um, I think it was one of those where I think they knew it was going to happen, but once it did, it just kind of went. And so that set everyone on fire for a little but bit. It was a total surprise, everybody. Just, like, it was a surprise that we had... A lot of Ukrainian students yeah. in the Q course, they were also surprised. Yeah. And we had to figure out how to send them back, right? But it was like, wow. Yeah. What, what was that day like when Little Green Men showed up in- uh, A Ukraine? lot of emails. A lot of emails and a lot of go get on the high side. Like you need to go get on the high side now. Do you think we should have been surprised though? No. It's kind of like, um, I think like you look back and let's look at when Iraq invaded Kuwait, right? You should right. have been surprised, but the majority of the Kuwaiti military was on leave. Yeah. Why? Well, and I so I think- and this is one of the things that I learned from this and, and working with the interagency folks at the <clears> embassy and, and listening to them and especially listening to analysts, right? And listening to analysts try to pitch what they see as a target and, and getting to be a part of that process to be like, okay, so what is a threat? What is a target? What fits to what we're looking at? And watching the different pieces of the intelligence community try to negotiate and argue over what is a target. Mm -hmm. You know, what are your sources telling you? What are your sources telling you? What do you see this being? Hey, do you agree with me? What do you think? And so while I don't think it was totally a surprise, I think that as everyone who has a piece of that pie as everyone is trying to predict and understand and build those contingency plans, I think you run into that thought process of like, nobody really gets it right. And often you run into people that are, maybe one person has piece A, maybe one person has piece B, and they just can't bring it together. It's not clear. It's There's just no not clear, clarity. right? Yeah. There's no clarity to it. And and so as much as we believe that Putin telegraphs, like I was shocked at the, le I thought he was going to just kind of I think it's a matter of win, right? I don't think... It's ever been a like, okay, Belarusia, Ukraine, right. and Georgia are what they believe puts together what they need. And economically, it makes sense, right? Totally. 
Um, you look at the fall of Soviet Union and, and what it put Russia, like you know, in as far as economically. Like they need those entities to be competitive. So to me, it's not a question of would it happen, so when would it happen, because it makes sense. I would, if I was in issues, I'd probably do the same thing. Maybe not like he did it. But I would probably have the same goals because it makes sense for the country. I was more that shocked. Weird. I'm not, I'm not a Russian sympathizer at all. <laughs> but if I had to look at it from a logical point of view as a country and I was stating the same things he was stating, like, OK, I've, st- I've said what my goals are. Yeah. You being surprised is your fault. Yeah, I would agree. And I think I think the, the shock for me was kind of two ends on the Ukraine piece to kind of take a little left here. But it was the way that he went about it. And then it was the response from Ukraine. I had a few conversations. I was like, "This is you not surprised him." Uh, I th- oh, absolutely. I think the uh, I think they underestimated the level of training. Yeah. Uh, I think they underestimated the level of training and the ca- the competency of Ukrainians, specifically well, why, their soft. What happened there? Like, why do you think that was where it was? Or why do you know that was the question? <laughs> yeah, and, you know, having spent some time in soccer here and understanding that that uh, the push uh, after 2014 uh, and really the level of training that went into, I mean, like you said, we had Ukrainian soft in the Q course here yeah. before they went over. Like we, that investment that started about yeah. seven years ago. It did. It, it started in and 2014. That's not sensitive information for no. them. Like, no. oh, you guys are putting it on what it is. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and like we did a phenomenal job and I, I got to sit down, uh, in my time over in Eastern Europe, uh, a few, a, a month or so ago, I got to sit down with some of those, like the SimC team that was SimC Ukraine mm-hmm. and sit down and listen to them and, and their piece and, and understanding how that works. And, it, it's it's Zelensky, I think, blew my mind. I mean, he's putting on a master class in crisis leadership mm-hmm. and messaging, I think, personally. Uh, and I think he's been one of the reasons the, the competency and the success of their military and small engagements and in some large engagements. Uh, and then the other side of it, the ability to message and drive that into a national identity. Uh, Ukraine's national identity is rooted in history at this point. And it will, I think, will, depending on the outcome of this, which I think we can all see is is slowly shifting towards a positive Ukrainian outcome. Uh, I think the national identity of Ukraine is going to be rooted in this moment, is going to be buried in history, and in my mind, stand up to almost like the founding of, of, of our country and how they look at it. Because this is definitely an underdog uh, that has risen up and fought beyond any expectation. Yeah. What do you think happens since we're on the subject right now, after that, what, what, you know, what, what, what's rooted in Russia's history? I think it depends on how they leave or how this ends. Like if they end up solidifying the Eastern side of Ukraine in a negotiation, uh, if they end up making it uninhabitable through other means, uh, and expelling, giving themselves an easy out. I always looked at that as, you know, subversion or, or sabotage on a nuclear facility and just leaving a wasteland that created a buffer, hmm. which I'd, that's just my own personal, like it gives them an easy out while saving face and blaming on the Ukrainians, which is kind of the Russian model. But I think depending on how Russia moves forward from this, I think we're watching the transition, you know, Putin, his health issues, his age. Uh, I think we're going to see how Russia responds to that kind of void that's going to be there and how they respond to that void and what they look like in 10 years. is going to dictate how they view this moment in their history. Very well said. I like that. Uh, let's let's kind of go back to so to Bosnia. Yeah, Bosnia. <laughs> your, your past <laughs> Took a left. Bosnia. Yeah. So uh, so uh, Crimea happens. So Ukraine happens. Take one, uh, and then uh, so we kind of restructure and, and go through a rethought process. Then more or less just get back on track to the exact same mission that we had before. Uh, and then in 2014 uh, June, I believe, uh, we had the hundred year floods in Bosnia, and this really this event really defined my life. And so. At this point, uh, we're up in the Republic of Srpska in a town called Banja Luka, and we're training the, the, the CT unit or the special police unit up north. Uh, my team sergeant and I are leaving our, we, we brought in a few extra SOCA medics, working through doing the training, and we start heading south, and the river starts to flood, like no kidding, and a little Hyundai Elantra man, and like the water's coming up over the road, and we have to stop because it's up over the wheels, turn around and race back north because <laughs> we couldn't make it to Sarajevo, like driving away like as the flood is flooding. Uh, so we spent two weeks up in the floodplain. Uh, I think almost 3 million people were uh, displaced overnight. Uh, it was massive. So the Saba River, which runs through Serbia, Bosnia, Croatia, just went. Uh, it was crazy um, to the point of where you would walk into the third story of a house because the mud had filled up the first two stories. Uh, it, was ca- it was catastrophic. It was my first real experience. Like I'd seen damage in Iraq. I'd blown up plenty of buildings. Uh, same thing in Afghanistan, you know, but this was what was an amazing country in the morning. Uh, the damage was done overnight and oh it was gosh. insane. 
And so when that hit, uh, I kind of looked around and we just went to work. Uh, Colonel Miller did an incredible job of bringing resources in from uh, Army Warehouse in Italy. Uh, we helped coordinate the international response up north. Uh, and then we finally, roads cleared up and we were able to get back down to our team house in Sarajevo. Uh, and then I went from, you know, muddy roughs. I took a shower, I threw a suit on and I went to represent U.S. Embassy at the, uh, the UN and the cluster meetings in, in natural disaster. And so at that point, we really kind of st stood back and started to look at from more of our perspective, like, okay, so we have a huge vacuum. We have this catastrophic event. What, uh, who's trying to influence the space. And we found like 15 different communities that were completely cut off. They were receiving some funding from sources we didn't understand, but they were completely cut off and had no water. And so I called a buddy of mine from, uh, from the Captain's Career Course uh, who had, was a company commander in Afghanistan and had worked with Waves for Water, the founder. Brought him over to, okay. I, I, remember, I think, Kunar Valley. Uh, and they did a project, it was very successful. And I called him, I was like, hey man, do you have that filter guy's number? <laughs> He's like, I do. I, I called him, I was like, John, we spoke once before I went to Afghanistan. I'm in Bosnia now. Do you want to come over and do some work? And he was like, absolutely. When do you want me on a plane? I was like, cool. And we talked budget. We worked it out. I made some phone calls. I started doing the approval process to spend some of my P11 dollars to get it done. Uh, and so we got the approval process cleared. John got on a plane. Define P11 dollars though for? Uh, operational fund. For special operations. For special operations, correct. Uh, and so there's this piece of that that can be used for humanitarian civic, humanitarian civic. So it's assessment. one of the things that being part of SOF is really good because you got we got yep. eleven dollars exactly. pots exactly. of money pots of money yeah pots of money lots and of money so, there. Uh, so they flew over uh, this was this is the funnier part and so because I'd been training the Bosnian military as well as the special police units I had a really good relationship with them and so and with Colonel Miller and his relationship we able to go over and talk to him and they're like we have a helicopter for you. And so initially you're like, you can't ride those helicopters, man. I was like, it's going to be okay. It's going to be great. And they're like, <laughs> I'm telling you, you can't, you make your own decision. I'm like, all right, it's good. This is not a problem. And I get over and there's a video of this on YouTube that uh, Waves for Water did, Waves for Water in Bosnia. And you see me walking up to it. What you can't see is my face looking at this 1970, 1960 UH-1 with like an orange door, uh, talking to a pilot who at this time is pretending to not speak English to me. I'm like, so we're at the map, we're going to land. He goes, yes, we will land. I was like, so here he goes, yes, we will land. And like, we're going to a mountain. Like this is the mountains in Bosnia are Rockies. Like it is not small. Like they are mountains. And he's like, yeah, we're going to fly up. We will land here. I was like, that's the side of a mountain. He goes, yes. And I'm like, do you understand me? He goes, yes, fly land here. And I'm like, oh my God. Sounds like Robin Sage. <laughs> it, it was, it was unreal. And so I get in with him, his co-pilot, we load, like we've got buckets and like the, the water filters and John gets in like, you know, former pro surfer gets in. He's like, this is awesome. And I'm like, okay. And I look and I watch him look up and he takes a post-it note and flips it around. And I don't know if he put the post-it note in there, like the toggles were broken, like the, the GPS, this was not a glass cockpit. Like this is the same cockpit that, you know, the original, you know, <laughs> first cab flew in on in Vietnam. <laughs> and he's got a TomTom -tom GPS and he's like tapping it and it turns on and then he fires this thing up and it like sputters smoke. And then he flies that thing like, I mean, mow the lawn. Like we didn't even go up. We just went forward. And it was, I was just, I'm sitting there like where, like I look at my team starting, he's looking at me and John and his videographer are like happy as a clam. I was like, we're going to die. And so we get up, we fly for about an hour. We get to the mountains. So and you're I'm saying going, there's bliss and ignorance. Bliss and ignorance, man. Oh my God. Yes. And so we get to, we get to this mountain town and I'm looking and, and I'm on the comms and the pilot's like, there, land. And I'm like, oh my God. And I look and I'm like, I can't spot any of this. And I just see a soccer field. And I mean like a high school soccer field with wires around it and a school. And I see people standing outside. I was like, there's no way we're landing there. And he does one circle around the school and looks and he look and he's like pointing land. And I was like, oh God, oh my God, we're going to die. And he just goes one flare and drops it right in the center of it. I mean, he maybe had 15 feet to the wires on each side of that, of that rotor. <laughs> Love it. And that dude could fly. At this point, he goes... How do you think my landing was? I was like, you speak English. <laughs> and so we get out, we do the project there. The next day we fly back in. The next day we go to another project together. John and I become friends. Project, stays what's, the what's the project? So about? the project we did was, so Waves for Water does access to clean water in remote and austere environments. Like, okay. you know, a crazy helicopter ride in the mountains of Bosnia. Uh, and each filter is a small gravity fed Sawyer filter. You can buy it uh, at REI, right? Or in Amazon. But the cool part is it's gravity fed. It takes care of all of your biological, you know, contaminants. 
and it has a lifespan of a million gallons. So you put it on a bucket, you give it to a family of five, it'll last for 20 years. Wow. And so, and it's easily portable. So we had a duffel bag with a hundred filters in it, you know, and if you run them at max capacity, that's a hundred people per filter per day. So you can make a huge impact for relatively little cost and very small logistical buy-in. And so we did, I think, 50 filters in that one town. So 50 families plus some community centers. And, and then the next one, I think the first project we did together, we, we provided access to clean water for about 15,000 people. And so for me, that was great for me to go back to the country team and be like, Hey, here's what we've achieved. And they were like, all right, what do you need next? So I went to USAID, tried to find their pots of money and then went to the UN, found their pots of money, went to a buddy of mine. I'd the uh, Austrian ground force commander that I'd spent some time uh, at a ball and again, drinking and making relationships. Mm -hmm. And he, he's like, hey, do you need a Black Hawk helicopter? And I was like, yes, I do. Yes, I and do. Waves for Water came in for a second round that was funded by USAID. And we flew it to like 10 more villages in my private Black Hawk where they literally landed it at a gas station, turned, locked the key and went and got a cup of coffee while we did the project. It blew my mind and it happened because of relationships. Uh, but that built my relationship with John and also showed me the impact of we were able to really have an impact in these communities and close that gap for foreign money and foreign influence to come in to shape that area, uh, we'd been able to close that gap by uni using a unified action partner, right? Using Waves for Water, utilizing Waves for Water, uh, depending on how we want to go with that word. Uh, and that, that really shaped me going forward. Uh, and so that shaped a lot of my experience uh, when I came to SOT-D, you know, walked into the, the team room at SOT-D and had the first team leader, uh, SF guy ran to there, John Johnson, who I love, good friend John of mine. John. Say, John, John. And he looked at me, he goes... Well, define SOT-D real quick. Yeah, so SOT-D, the Special Operation Training Detachment at the CTC mm -hmm. that uh, Bobby has been so dutifully pitching uh, but, this but time. Like, what's their primary purpose? So primary mind? purpose is to facilitate special operations training uh, at the CTCs. Okay. So provide qualified post-team mentors and trainers and observer coach trainers, and then also provide a realistic training environment that supports critical soft tasks. Is that a good way to say it? I think that's about it. And a lot of people don't, they don't want to go to those jobs, right? But they are critical. I fought it. Honestly, I like the, everybody uh, fights it. I fought it so hard. I've, I was, I fought it my entire career and so far I've won. You, you mean you're telling me you can go to a position where, okay, it's post team time, mm -hmm. but you get to use your own experiences to impart your knowledge yeah. and things you've learned to people who are a little bit younger than you going through their training reps and then you get so to all nine groups, civil affairs, psyops, SF. Yep. And you get to see the diversity of thought that every one of those groups across CA, civil affairs, and psyops, the way they do things. And you can say, hey, I saw, you know, based off of first special forces groups, you know, thought process of working in the, in the Pacific, they do things this way. And I saw it work this way. I'm going to coach you through because I saw a, a way you take it and see if it works for your team or you try or experiment at your level and see what works for you. Guys. So, I mean, honestly, for me, when I got the orders, I was still in Bosnia and I looked at this and, and mind you, at this point, I hadn't done a day of staff as an officer. Like I was a platoon leader for 20 plus months. I was an executive officer, almost all that in combat. I was a team leader for four years and I was like, there was not a piece of me that wanted to stop doing work at that point. And to me, and, and cause I agree with you, but at that time I didn't understand that. So sure. Most yeah, the okay. chief of mission and, and the uh, the defense attaché went to went to town for me. Tried to get me to come over, or tried to set it up for me to come over as a, as a softly with my family. I was going to move my whole family to Bosnia, which would have been amazing. Uh, but it just you know it didn't work out. Once the CTC has you, it's an inescapable force of gravity. And so, uh, but I, I will say, like going talking well, to John, escape Joe, I've escaped it. It's escape. It's escapable. It is a scam. That's the, you're the first because I've man. I'm just saying, we're not being forced to say this by a CG. We're not getting paid to say all this. <laughs> and even though I've escaped the the CTCs, they 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 are like it's value added. Like to be, be able to affect that many people oh, in yeah. a positive manner, hugely is rewarding to the point where I check in on the guys, those folks regularly, and then have utmost the respect. But yep. I try to share that knowledge apart it, and then you know preach about it because it's I learned a ton. Yeah, but it comes it was, back to like what you said earlier. Like I do like Maslow's hierarchy. People think it's it's ridiculous, but I yeah. think that when you're doing things in life, they're at the top of that, and you're and you're making decisions and executing for things that fulfill you in a, in a spiritual manner, and that's not talking about like God or whatever. It's just like what internally, that's where it's at, right? Like you're doing things in a that are for positive influence on systems, people, or yep. whatever, right? But that's what the CTC is. No, it, it's and I or it I, can be. 
or I, cannot be, depending on you. I agree with Bobby. Like that job was incredibly rewarding, incredibly rewarding. And it started on a rough foot because John John was like, what are you doing here? Why do you belong? And you guys, CA does not belong in this force structure. And what experience do you have to coach me or give me advice? Well, it was, it was interesting because he was a fellow coach, right? So okay. he was the SF guy. He's like, what are you doing here? And thankfully, like I, at that point, I'd had a ton of experience in both combat and working in the interagency. So I was able to be like, well, this is how. And he goes, oh. And yeah, I became great friends. <laughs> but it, it is that piece. And I, I, everything you said about that job, it was incredibly rewarding. I learned so much from working with people like Chris Perry, who's become one of my best friends, mm-hmm. like working with people like you. Uh, Colonel Dyke was my first Sati commander and then Scotty Malone. Was oh, second Scott one. Malone. They were, they were fantastic, right? Those are two of the most amazing officers I had the, that took care of men in a way that I was – it was just phenomenal. The, the way that they treated me and brought me made me a part of that team really made the experience down there. Uh, so I learned a ton, got to go through that process. Uh, and then I left active duty from there. Okay. And, and Damn, that's a transition right there. I know. Was that good? Is that a little rough? No, it's, that's no a, is it transition from active duty? Oh, yeah. Right? No, yeah. the transition is, is crazy. Like you're going to go from CTC <laughs> to not being active duty anymore. Like most people fear getting out of the army anyway. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah. It was like HR looked, they called and, and my branch manager was like, you know, you can't come back. I was like, that's the point. The way this came about is I was, I started to talk to John, John Rose and I, you know, we made and maintained, stayed in contact. Uh, and probably about two months prior to me deciding to separate, John had been like, Hey, we're doing a lot of work with us embassies. I need some help building kind of a purpose built team cross functional team, if you will, uh, inside of Waves for Water that will be able to work directly with military elements uh, that speak the language and can work from there. And I was like, yeah, it sounds great. He's like, will you help me just design it and build it? I was like, yeah, no problem. And then a month later, he called me back and he's like, hey, this is great. It's awesome. Do you want to come run it? And do you want to come build it? And I looked at him, I was like, well, let me talk to the wife. And he's like, because you're thinking about getting out. I was like, well, I'll toss the, the idea around. And He's like, I have no idea what I can pay you, man. He's like, we're not big. Um, so I got off the phone. Uh, I talked to the wife and I was like, I don't think this phone call happens very often. Like John Rose is a, an amazing dude who's like built a rad organization with just incredible identity that has an amazing impact. And I was like, how do I say no to this? Like, what is like, does CGSC really mean that much to me? Does being a force provider and a staff officer going forward really mean that much to me? Um, and, and to what you said, right? Like, uh, I think the word that captures, you know, what you're talking about is purpose. Like, what is your purpose? And if you don't have a clear purpose in your life, and and I would argue at this point, having done the job for 10 years on the line in some capacity, right? Never back up in in a higher headquarters. I feel like I was starting to lose my purpose because that's all I knew. So I was easily able to look at this and having done work with John in Bosnia and seen the impact, I was like, this is awesome. And not only do I get to go do this for myself, but I get to build an organization that works with other military. And then John and I went around. I was like, you know, what if we build a veteran organization? So it's not just geared towards working with the U.S. embassies. It's geared towards taking veterans that have separated, have lost their purpose, giving them a new team and a new purpose uh, and a way that will help them ease transition and, and give back to the world that they've, you know, they've functioned in for so long. And so that was the birth of the Clean Water Corps. I dropped my paperwork and I left. And I mean, I'll never forget the second I was like, I'm in, he's like, I need you in Guyana in three days. And I will never forget the look on Colonel Dyke's face. And I was like, Hey, sir, I got to go to Guyana. He's like, what? I was like, tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, it's a job interview. And he, he, he took care of me. He made it happen. But that was the start of it. And it has been five years of just like up until the center of 2020, when COVID, you know, just hammered the nonprofit space. We did a ton of work, like a ton of work. Okay, so I wanted to ask, so you're, yep. you're kind of talking now of we've transitioned from the civil affairs entity and, and a mindset yep. of civil affairs, civil yep. governance, uh, and mapping that that mm-hmm. uh, that population and civil terrain. Now you're looking at humanitarian assistance and yes. disaster response. hundred percent. In crisis, helping people yep. get necessities to survive yep. and then to function to, to get better, to improve the situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're, we bring access to clean water and we're usually on the ground, you know, 24 hours after the event happens. Uh, in some cases like Hurricane Maria, I was in San Juan. Uh, we went down following Mer- or Hurricane Irma, uh, did some work cruising around with, you know, former drug runners who turned humanitarian logistic nodes uh, and running on speedboats throughout the Virgin Islands. And then Maria popped up and I flew into San Juan on the 18th and I sat on my 
uh, my 36th birthday, I sat in Isla Verde, uh, what or Isla Grande watching the world end around me. Like it was crazy. I mean, for Idaho, man, I don't know what a hurricane is. Like I'm not from the East coast. Like I know a snowstorm and a blizzard. So when the walls started like bleeding water and I called Otto Flores, one of the pro surfers, one of my teammates, there, I was like, Hey man, like, is this normal? <laughs> Cause like the walls were just bleeding. And so we went downstairs at like 3 AM sat with the bartender in the hotel we were at and watched the world end around us taking shots. And that was a crazy experience for me. And then the next day we got up and started to go to work and, and it's been that way from, you know, partnering with BMW and riding across the Gobi Desert to working the following the floods in Peru to the Amazon to, I mean, Chris Perry and some of my team did a crazy work after Hurricane Adele or Cyclone Adele uh, in Mozambique. And it's just one of those things where taking some of the skills that, that we have in the military, specifically in special operations, and then applying it to a humanitarian thought process, which really comes down to the ability to build relationships at all level. Like I always told my PMs and, and my vets coming in, like, look, I need you to go to a CEO's office of a fortune 500 and build relationship and get support from him. And in the same day, take a 12 hour boat ride and get to a small village, you know, all the way up the Amazon river in the jungle and build relationship with the local power broker in that village. Then I also need you to plan logistics along that entire route. And I need you to build relationships that'll facilitate that. It's the same thing that we do uh, from the special operations side of the house. It's just applied to bringing a, a need to a people. And I feel like I went on a little bit of a tangent. <laughs> no, so what I think is fascinating though is you've now kind of pivoted in your career mm -hmm. to become a first responder, whereas with the military side, you're constrained by authorities or requirements. Yep. You, you have to wait for the United States government to deploy you in that Completely. HADR capacity. Yep. On the nonprofit side, you're, you're, you're just going. Yeah, absolutely. You are, crisis has happened, catastrophe has happened, you're in, you're headed out there right now. Yep. Um, two things I want to kind of ask in that realm is we've, we've talked, so Chuck and I talked with uh, with uh, CX John Troxel, and he preached a lot on fighter management. How do you talk or think about responder management on the ground for first responders and taking care of the people that you're working with? and managing their energies. So, yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot to that. So it depends on, am I bringing in, uh, like, are we talking about like my external team that I bring into the scenario or am I talking about the team that I build on the ground, right? Because we still work that by, with, and through thought process of the Clean Water Corps, right? I want to go in, I want to find people that are motivated, already having a, dis, uh, like making a difference, having an impact. And then I want to give them the, training equipment. Like, you know, I want to teach them how to do the program, how to manage the filters. And I want to like basically equip them so they can expand that impact and do more. So it's kind of two thought process, right? I have to manage my team of trainers and then I have to manage the team that's on the ground. And I think managing the team on the ground, the, the local team is harder because I have to manage their relationships and what's going on in their life because their entire world is just ended around them. So Otto Flores is a great example. Um, his entire family, like we moved out of his house, boarded it up, his two sons, his dog, his mom, his wife stayed in the hotel. The hotel got cr like crushed, so we had to leave the hotel. And we were calling different people that he knew that had fled the island and breaking into different apartment buildings. Like at times we were uh, trading fuel with different areas for generators to get access to places to stay. And so it took us three or four days to get his family taken care of before he could even focus on doing the work I needed him to do. It's like when you see in the movies, uh, you know, asteroids about to hit right. and you've got the security guard who's sitting there just like guarding the gate. Like yeah. that guy's, that guy's family is thinking exactly. about evacuating. Exactly. So that guy's also going to panic internally. Yeah. But in the movies, he's just calm, cool, collected and just like guarding this Which is ridiculous. Gate, which isn't rea rea yeah. realistic. No. Well, it goes down to too, like you're managing your team, like in the military. Like if you're doing a good job of it, you understand what's going on in your team, in, in your guy's life. Because that home life, what they have going on affects everything it affects readiness it affects readiness yeah. oh god that's that that's definitely an officer point for bringing in readiness <laughs> um but yeah that's that's de that's the thought process right there is no difference and and i think he's right like fighter management or, or you know responder management it's the same thing you're still managing people it still comes down to leadership the principles and the attributes are still the same it is just understanding that you cannot look at your person your your team as numbers you have to look at them as people address those needs and then motivate them and create that shared vision so they can execute. It's the same thing. But I also want to say 
you get two extra officer points <laughs> for playing the officer game of trying to arbitrarily yes. allocate officer points Deflect to officer your peer. <laughs> so, so you I didn't him. know if you were going to pick up what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing that game. <laughs> Damn, you caught me. Hey, but while we're talking about that, yeah. just you know, we're at the end of the podcast. I just want to share with, with Bobby what me and you were looking at earlier <laughs> in regards to Bosnia and Ukraine. So there's a commonality in Ukraine between Vladimir Putin, Batman, and Will Smith. Yep. You know what it is? I have no idea. Well, between What's the Putin overlap? and Batman rules through fear, right? Batman and Will Smith, no, 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 no. Putin and Will Smith is came to prominence via top secret intelligence agency, right? And then through all three of them, attacked comedian. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. For those of you who don't know, Zelensky was a comedian yeah. before he uh, came to power. So. I saw a few of his uh, videos. That's what we were laughing about earlier. When he was like, damn it. That's so good. I could not even focus. Once you put that, it was so good. <laughs> well, I love that in his TV show, he played a guy, a teacher that becomes a president in the TV show. And then he becomes the president. It's it's more entertaining. There is a corruption problem in Ukraine, right? Absolutely. But I don't think that validates what's going on now. I mean, that is a, like a, a problem in the country post Soviet Union, but mm -hmm. it's almost to the core of what's acceptable as a society there, right? Like those, those, that takes a long time to. So it's going to be really interesting, and and from our perspective, and like my team having a few teams on the ground that are working there now, and. and getting direct feedback from them, you know, the number one business, I think they said for the next 10 years is going to be rubble removal. Yeah. Right. And there's going to be an insane so economic, all three of us should create a company <sighs> that offers on the table. <laughs> uh, but so you look at it and there is, so if there's going to be a powers huge, combined. <laughs> there's going to be a huge power vacuum. Right. Yeah. And so, like I said earlier, Ukraine's history is going to be rooted in this moment, but what they do after this can Zelensky, who had shown himself to be a typical Eastern European leader prior to this event. And now change that. And now change that. Can he ride this national movement, this national identity? And like you said, now they have this. Now they have a national identity. Exactly. Which they didn't have really didn't. after the fall of the Soviet Union. Correct. Right? But so, now they do. So maybe Russia has done them a favor. It, it's. I think they have. A, I actually a, think... A horrible, a horribly implemented favor. But, yes. But look at... Look at the cycle of every great nation right. requires some kind of struggle and violence. Absolutely. I, I think I think if, if Zelensky can, if he survives this, if he can maintain the momentum and the identity, and he does at his heart, which I think he does, want to build back a less corrupt, more modern European state, I think they'll be successful. But there's going to be a lot of work because the amount of foreign actors, because what you have now, you have a front. Now, a lot of people understand this. Like All of Ukraine is not burning. You have a legitimate front. You have legitimate combat areas, and it's almost World War II style. Behind that front, there's resource control measures. There's restrictions. You, but you just had Ukraine participating in a uh, World Cup friendly exactly. to, to make the World Cup. Like, right. Think, and, the world is still going on. Yeah. Life is still progressing for Ukraine. And that country to the West, the like yeah. other than the amount of logistics and everything going through and the shift and how that looks, there's still people positioning themselves, like not necessarily positive actors, that are positioning themselves for when this ends. If, if, if you think people wait until the conflict is over to start to piece off that future, you're you completely missed, wrong. You missed the boat. And, and I, that's going to be the challenge is, is Zelensky in the right place with the right mindset and the right team to go away from that? And is the international community in a position to mitigate that as well to support him? It's There's a lot of unknowns with how that's going to shape out because it is Eastern Europe. It's a weird, weird place. It's a weird place. It's a well, great all, place. All I love Europe, it. All of Europe is in, like to our mind. Oh yeah, C completely different. Yeah, yeah it's not. It's not the same. And yeah, people I, tend. I don't to even think that. they understand it. No. It's <laughs> kind of like going to Afghanistan. Like, hey guys, like explain to me like the whole tribal culture. I'm like, and then you're like, okay, you guys don't even understand what. No. You, you guys don't understand Pashtun well either. Like, no, but it's, it's our culture. It's so what it is. <laughs> yep. We understand it in this little part. This yeah. little <laughs> vacuum right here. <laughs> Very complicated. All right, next one. So, Rob McQueen, what is your relationship to Lightning or Steve McQueen? <laughs> So no relationship to Lightning McQueen, unfortunately, as my right, daughters so are very disappointed. 
Uh, but Steve McQueen, according to my aunt and my, my mother who've done the research, is my great half uncle. So he was half brothers with my grandfather. So they shared the same dad, different moms. Hell yeah. Yeah, never got to meet him. Like, it would have been rad. He died before I was born. He's still uh, pretty badass. He's pretty badass, right? A little bit of legacy. Favorite Rob. Favorite Steve McQueen. <laughs> Lots of Rob McQueen stories. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of, yeah. Favorite Steve McQueen character. Uh, Papillon, for sure. 100%. Uh, Great Escape's great. Um, Sand Pebbles is good, but like Papillon, man, that's such a good movie. Rob, all right, as our last topic for our Pineland Underground episode, I want to talk to you about Cine Pare or Without Equal. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about what you guys are doing and uh, enlighten us in our audience, please. Yeah. So myself, uh, two good friends of mine, Chris Perry, uh, 23 years first group, and Steve Carville, former 10th group guy. Uh, we got together, came up with the idea to kind of do leadership development, right? How do we, as we transition from the humanitarian space and we look at the way forward, how do we help shape kind of the leadership dynamic in this country? And I think we could probably all look at it and, and see across pretty much every sector out there gaps in leadership, right? I think that's a key part. And so we looked at ways we can influence that and we built Sine Pari. Uh, we took a pretty advanced leadership methodology created by my partner, Steve, uh, we have an inc- access and, and used to an incredible campus outside Huntsville, Texas, a 1,200 acres, a training facility, pretty much around Camp McCall. Uh, and we run executives, junior leaders, and team members through a 48 to 72 hour experiential leadership experience, right? It's a crucible. Like we put them through real world scenarios, complex obstacles, run them through different team positions, start them in a small team, work them all the way up to a 12-man team in a a more or less full mission profile. Uh, And we really stress them out. And then we let them go through that learning model and and really gain a lot of experience in a short period of time uh, and and go from there. So it's it's an experience. Stress inoculation. That's exactly what we do. That's exactly what we do. Which is something that, you know, just talking to some buddies, even in the the law enforcement area that's... Most people outside of soft don't have that. No. And it's, it's important, right? Because like, what do you do when all these chemicals are pumping that you're not used to yeah. and you have to make a decision? Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been amazing. The first class we ran October of last year, we had a variety from nonprofit founders to vice presidents. And one of the nonprofit founders, she runs an organization called Off the Grid Missions. And so she was just in Ukraine uh, last week and sent us, she was like, if I hadn't gone through that, I wouldn't have been able to manage the stress I was under. And I was like, that's a huge feedback and a great a benefit for us. And so we've got a great team of former CA, Green Berets, PSYOP uh, agency, just amazing people that love to do this. So it's great to get together with the team on, a, on an amazing location in Texas. And then the, just... Like, Texas is amazing anyway. It right? would be Texas, wouldn't it? It, it, it would be the greatest Texas. country in the world. You know, it has that potential. That's a fact. Um, although there's a lot of California, just like Idaho, there's a lot of Californians going into Texas too. So I think you're going to run into a conversation on that piece. Uh, so but I yeah, it's to California. That's why I was sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it, it's an amazing company. Uh, we're excited to get it off the ground and move it forward. Uh, we have another class coming up in October uh, and we're just going from there. We have a good podcast called Without Equal uh, where we talk about leadership, break down historical references, uh, and then honestly talk about some of our experiences and, and personal stories. So it's, it's been a good time. So please... Listen, and then uh, if you're curious, uh, it's uh, cinepare.com. So cine-pare.com. And that's, that's our podcast, website. correct? That is, yeah. Without Equal is a podcast. We're on all the major podcast pieces. Just search Without Equal. And that's us. I absolutely love that. So you brought together experienced RSOF members, veterans, individuals, first responders uh, who have, have quite mm-hmm. an experience, giving back, pumping those attributes back into corporate America. Uh, and it's really kind of sewing together a nice fabric of patriotism. But how that leadership, you know, pendulum kind of can, can, can blanket the the future of America. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that it's that purpose, right? Like, take what we've learned and the experience that we've been thankful enough to have, and then just roll it into the people that haven't gone down that path, uh, and make them better for it. Because the the higher the level is across our country, uh, the better off we are as a nation as whole. And to be able to impact that, I think, is a is a rad thing. And my life's been focused on purpose. I've kind of chased it at every turn. It's worked out for me and the opportunity to give back and, and work through that process is just awesome. Well, Rob, that, I mean, to me, that kind of articulates a life of service. You know, you have given back in the army, 
you've given back as a special operations member, you've looked at the civil blanket of where we have been across conf the conflict con uh, continuum, and then you've also dabbled in the humanitarian side, getting important things, survivability to people who need it as a first responder on the ground on behalf of you know our nation, but all, really on behalf of just the greater good of humanity. Mm -hmm. So life at service is kind of a way to nicely round it out. And I'd say just one good job to uh, keep representing, and then three, we're proud of you, and, and, and you know, keep, keep stay, stay tied into the uh, the soft community and the army community for what you guys need going forward. Absolutely, it's given me so much. I'm just happy to give back in any way I can. Any closing comments from uh, from Chuck and Rob? No, I'll just say person? that Rob, like this guy's been like, man, we gotta get Rob McQueen on the podcast for like forever, <laughs> and, he, and we finally got you on here because it just happened that you're gonna be here, and. Yeah, he was like, hey, look, this guy runs a podcast. It's superior to ours. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely no, not. He never said it. but uh, Definitely not. <laughs> he said, hey, that's one of the ones we need to look at. We need to make sure that, you know, we're talking about lessons learned and, and how to how to make ourselves better. And then it's probably last week. He's like, hey, Rob's going to be here. Let's get him on the podcast. I was like, hell yeah. Because we're talking about, hey, we're very SF heavy with this podcast, which is kind of jacked up. Um, so, you know, next, next week we have – a psyop um really probably one of the person that i understand like the most knowledgeable people within psyop to, to talk about the regiment and the history oh, epic. And, and we have you on and we have you know tulsi gabbard coming mm -hmm. pretty soon as well so i think that's pretty cool and really tying in the message of, to win the game you gotta understand a higher level you can't get just in your niche about Man, I'm, I'm i'm this like no if you want to win the overall game there's a bigger picture there yep. how, how do you do that you right? gotta understand your role right Right. And everybody else's role. And then exactly. what is the end state and what's going on and how do you best influence, you know, and I'd say in, in soft, instead of just kicking a door, shooting something in the face, like our, our real claim to fame is that we can take something, the battlefield, and instead of like saying we got to do X, Y, Z, no, we take everything. It's almost like the movie Inception. We manipulate mm -hmm. and round and, and, and take that and curve everything around us achieve an end state versus yep. something linear yep completely all right so that's major rob mcqueen veteran family man mentor humanitarian and entrepreneur rob thanks for being on pineland underground tonight really and appreciate it he man. could also be he could also be a model if he wanted to be could be he doesn't <laughs> no. have a beard but he's got really good hair he had a beard until today yeah the beard Apparently. is the beard is much better as my wife said it's the male it's the male push-up bra so like i rock that thing all the time yeah. like it's a win you see the picture in his bio he what is he drinking like is it Coors Light in mugs, like rocking your... <laughs> so if anybody from Sports <laughs> Illustrated is listening, this is... Reach out. Oh, God. You need to be on the cover. All right. Signing off from Pineland Underground <laughs> at the Falcon Snail Pub. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thanks for tuning in to Pineland Underground. Please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Join us next time as we explore more critical topics from the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School the Special Operations Center of Excellence. I'm your host, Major Bobby Tuttle, and we'll see you next time in Pineland Underground.